Hi, everyone. I'm Kurt Roney, uh, Professor of Strategic Management here at the University of Mount Olive. And uh, this video is being made for uh, my students in uh, a couple of courses uh, there at the university. Um, and uh, the subject uh, of uh, this video is the strategic impacts of the coronavirus. And uh, by this time, uh, when this video is being made, I doubt that there's anyone uh, looking at the video who isn't already well aware of the coronavirus. Uh, however, uh, the implications of the coronavirus uh, for uh, performance potentials of firms and strategic options of firms as we go forward uh, with the coronavirus and even after a vaccine is developed to uh, prevent uh, the coronavirus and those of us who are fortunate enough to get the, the vaccine, which is certainly uh, not going to be uh, the majority of the world's population for quite some time. Uh, but uh, our companies, ourselves, uh, will be impacted by the, uh, the virus. Uh, its impacts on industries where we do business or that affect our businesses. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's, and, and these implications, these effects are going to be with us for quite a while. So the purpose of this video is to try to look into uh, that issue and try to understand what the uh, potential consequences and ramifications of the coronavirus uh, will be as we go forward. Now, uh, if you've read very much at all about the coronavirus in industry, uh, you will know by this time that it's almost impossible to predict uh, exactly uh, what uh, to expect and when to expect it. Uh, because so much remains unknown about the timing and the, uh, the effectiveness of potential vaccines, uh, as well as therapeutic uh, approaches, uh, medicines to uh, treat the uh, uh, patient that uh, suffers from the virus. And uh, there's quite a lot of research and development going on both to produce vaccines and to produce medicines to treat patients who have contracted the coronavirus. So uh, with that in mind, it's really difficult to, to, uh, to predict uh, and with any great confidence uh, just when and how uh, the consequences will occur. But we've already seen some and there's been some uh, very good writing uh, about the implications of the coronavirus strategically. Uh, well, perhaps not strategically, but at least on uh, various industries. So uh, with that in mind, um, I'm going to try to summarize uh, the strategic implications of some of our readings in my classes. And these readings have come from uh, three publishers primarily. First, The Economist magazine, uh, both the, the magazine itself and its uh, online uh, uh, virtual version uh, where uh, the uh, uh, the Economist has, has published a great deal of very insightful information about the coronavirus and its impacts in uh, all walks of life, including commerce. Um, another source of uh, the writings that we've been looking at 
is the consulting firm McKinsey and Company. And McKinsey simply is uh, a bastion of uh, intelligence uh, and knowledge uh, with lots of talent to study issues such as this. And I say such as this because McKinsey has a regular stream of publications on topics that are relevant to uh, businesses and business people. If you haven't checked out the website uh, of either of those sources, The Economist and McKinsey and Company, I certainly encourage you to do so. The last source is the United Nations, uh, and particularly, uh, and it's, a, it's, it's, uh, its acronym is UNCTAD, and that makes it kind of difficult to memorize, so I wrote it down so I wouldn't make a mistake here in this video, uh, but it's the uh, UN uh, Conference on Trade and Development, uh, and in particular, UNCA CTAD uh, recently published the World Investment Report 2020. And once again, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to do so. And uh, in fact, we'll be looking at some uh, uh, figures, some exhibits uh, that uh, appeared in, in uh, that publication. So I wanna be sure to give it credit. Uh, and in fact, we'll be looking at some uh, figures that occur, uh, appeared in The Economist and uh, McKinsey's newsletter. So uh, those are the sources of, of the material we'll be looking at. So with that, uh, I think the best thing for me to do is to get the PowerPoints up here uh, and uh, see if we can't get started uh, going through them. So here we are. Um, I think one of the uh, first uh, uh, points to take into account uh, is that uh, although a vaccine is clearly uh, about to be delivered, there are, uh, I think, four or five, maybe even six that are in active testing uh, the uh, uh, phase three testing is where uh, the vaccine has already been uh, tested on animals and limited populations of humans for safety and dosage. Uh, now in very large uh, surveys of hundreds of, and if not thousands of people, <clears throat> these alternative vaccines uh, produced by a variety of uh, 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 laboratories and companies uh, are being tested in real life. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, po the politicians have been telling us that it's just a matter of, uh, of time before, uh, and not much time, uh, before uh, more than one uh, of these trials is successful. Pardon me, I have a hoarse throat and uh, so I'm uh, drinking a lot to uh, hopefully mo moisten my throat. Um, the, the point uh, to be made is that even after a vaccine becomes available, uh, it's going to be a very long time uh, before uh, vaccines reach uh, large enough a number of people uh, to introduce something called herd uh, immunity. That is to say enough people will be immune uh, that they will not uh, contract the virus and pass it on to someone else, <clears throat> which is what's been happening uh, recently. Again, you uh, have undoubtedly seen that in the news, but we'll look at uh, some figures in a, in a moment that will uh, characterize just how this, uh, this pandemic has unfolded. Uh, but it's, it's, it, when, when we get the vaccine, I think the important point and the, and the therapeutic drugs, <coughs> 
the important point is that the, the recovery back to normal, normal business conditions, normal civil conditions, normal social conditions uh, will not occur within weeks or even months. Uh, but it will probably take uh, at least a year. And as we'll see, uh, depending on the industry that we're talking about, it could be years before a full recovery is, uh, occurs. Uh, the other thing we need to bear in mind is that not all vaccines turn out to be uh, completely successful. Uh, the HIV drug uh, started out to be just partially successful, and it's, it still isn't completely successful. The most uh, uh, well-known case of delayed effectiveness is the polio vaccine, uh, which was developed by Dr. Salk uh, in 1955. Uh, but it took almost a quarter of a century uh, before that vaccine could be administered to kids uh, in a little sugar cube rather than an inoculation. Um, and uh, uh, polio essentially uh, was, uh, was removed as a global threat. It, it's, not a, uh, it's not a threat any longer, although every once in a while, a case still pops up. So uh, in the case of this dreaded disease, it took a quarter of a century to get everybody immune. Uh, the flu vaccine that you and I take every year, at least I hope you do, I sure do, um, depending upon the, uh, the strain of flu that it's dealing with in the current year uh, and uh, your personal circumstances, uh, is between 40 and 60 percent effective, uh, which is good. It's better than not taking it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's not a, a sure bet by any stretch of the imagination that, that when you get the flu vaccine, you're not going to get the flu. Um, on the other hand, uh, vaccines can be quite effective. Uh, one that uh, has probably gone down in history as the most effective uh, was uh, the measles vaccine, which uh, was 98% effective. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, you know, the, 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 the work of the scientists was uh, effective, very effective. So um, in one article that we read, it was stated uh, by an, uh, an expert was quoted that if a vaccine is 75% effective, which would be better than the flu vaccine today, right? Uh, that two thirds of the population would have to be uh, vaccinated before this herd immunity, that is uh, to avoid spreading and the, uh, the and pandemic or epidemics occurring. Uh, so to get 70, to get uh, herd immunity, uh, if the vaccine's 75% effective, then two thirds of us are going to have to get the uh, vaccine. And uh, as you may have heard, uh, a lot of people don't want to get vaccinated because they're afraid the vaccine will give them uh, the coronavirus. So. Um, it's, uh, it, it, as one person who was quoted in this article said, we're not going to get uh, herd immunity overnight just because we have the vaccine, but it's going to take quite a while before it, it takes effect and we're going to get safer bit by bit. One of the, uh, uh, the contingencies will be the availability of raw material uh, and uh, all the infrastructure requirements to make uh, and uh, package and distribute the vaccines. Uh, and um, uh, I think it's important to bear in mind also that you and I are, as we look at this slide, we're thinking about ourselves here in the United States. But uh, today, as I'm making this video, 
uh, the pandemic is rampant in one of the, the two largest nations population-wise in the world, and that's India. And India is very not well set up to deal with this problem. Um, there, are, there are several reasons for that, and uh, regrettably, uh, you know, the, I, I, I just don't have time to get into them in this video. Uh, but the infrastructure, the economics uh, of, of, uh, of dealing with a pandemic in India are, are very, very troubling very, very, uh, uh, and, and make it very difficult uh, to deal with this problem. Uh, and uh, this problem exists in many other countries uh, and especially in cities. Uh, populations around the world are moving into cities, uh, and uh, the bigger the city, with and the less the the sophistication of infrastructure, uh, the more difficult it is to control a pandemic. And of course, if a pandemic occurs in one country, now your problem is keeping people from traveling from that country to your country. And that's easier said than done. Uh, so if the pandemic were to be uh, a big problem in Mexico, by way of example, we'd have a big problem in this country, even though we're taking effective action here. Uh, so the, uh, the, the problem of immigration and the virus uh, migrating into our country will be with us for quite a while, even after we're dealing with the coronavirus effectively, uh, which will take a while too. So the bottom line here is that if we're doing strategic planning for uh, a corporation, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I guess for a corporation uh, or for a, a, a non-for-profit enterprise for that matter, uh, that we have to uh, be thinking not about putting the problem away after a vaccine is released, but dealing with the problem for what will probably be two or three years. And that's enough reason to do some planning. Um, now, um, <clears throat> what, uh, another article that we read uh, pointed to the problem of foreign direct investment. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the direct investment in this, uh, and by this we mean an investment by uh, one country into another country for uh, permanent uh, uh, purposes. Uh, and in this case, we're talking about other than investing in stocks and bonds and financial instruments, but rather investing in uh, property, plant, equipment, businesses, commerce, and so forth. Uh, so global FDI, uh, it has been estimated, will drop about 20% this year, and another 5 or 10% on top of that next year. So uh, this, again, gives us pause for thought. Uh, what does that mean? Well, what it may mean is that although you and I and our company might want to invest in, Af in an African country because we want to recover its minerals, or we'd like to invest in a, an electric power plant uh, in India or some, somewhere else in the world or some other business somewhere else in the world, uh, it may be that the government of the country that we're interested in investing in doesn't want us to invest and or our government will prohibit it or the United Nations uh, or a, uh, uh, another not-for-profit agency uh, will uh, impose limitations and restrictions on uh, investing across borders. Another big problem is simply the fact, and we will see it in an exhibit here pretty soon, but due to the coronavirus, I'm sure you've heard that uh, the U.S. economy uh, was terribly impacted in the uh, first and second quarters 
uh, made a recovery uh, in the third quarter, but not all the way. And another recovery is expected in the fourth quarter. However, at the end of the year, estimates vary. Again, we can't be precise in this stuff. Uh, but uh, uh, the estimates anywhere from uh, six to nine percent uh, reduction in U.S. GDP uh, this year, a little worse in Europe, uh, and uh, uh, the impacts differ in various countries. Surprisingly, uh, and this this raises all kinds of of uh, debate and argument, uh, but apparently China's economy where all this began in the city of Wuhan, where I, I've been to Wuhan. Um, and it's a, I'm a manufacturing kind of guy and Wuhan's a manufacturing kind of place. Uh, but uh, uh, in any event, uh, this began in Wuhan. Uh, and uh, uh, I imagine Wuhan has been a little less uh, profitable than other parts of China where technology is produced in uh, the southeastern portion of China. In any event, uh, China's economy is apparently going to grow in three or four percent this year. So if the U.S. drops five or six or seven percent and China grows three or four percent, you've got give or take a 10% gap in the growth rates of those two economies. And uh, by the way, that gap has existed now since 2013. Uh, on a purchasing power uh, parity basis, China's economy is larger than the US, not on a per capita basis, but, uh, and that's because there are 1.4 billion people in China, 1.3 billion plus in India, which will soon have more people in China. Uh, but uh, uh, be that as it may, uh, if corporate profits are down uh, in a country, uh, and uh, bear in mind that corporate profits are down a lot more in some countries than in the United States, that provides less retained earnings, less capital to invest in to, or to make foreign direct investment or simply uh, domestic investment, just whether we invest in our own country uh, or uh, in, a, in another country. If we do it in another country, it's foreign direct investment. But uh, corporate profits account for about half of foreign direct investment. So uh, with lower profitability due to the coronavirus, uh, economic activity across borders is going to be subdued for some time. And again, we'll see a graph here pretty soon that'll make that a little more uh, graphic for you. Um, and uh, uh, sadly, the uh, countries that need uh, that investment the most will get it the least. And that's because among other things, they'll still be fighting the coronavirus when we probably won't be. Uh, here's a, an interesting uh, uh, graph, um, trying to remember which one of those sources I, I got it from, uh, and it's probably uh, McKinsey, but uh, don't, I, I, should, I should have uh, put, put the reference at the bottom of, of the graph, so shame on me. Uh, but the point of this graph, if you, if you take a look at it, is that the blue line, uh, which is foreign direct investment, has not been keeping up uh, with uh, uh, GDP uh, and foreign trade. So although trade has kept up with uh, GDP, that's the little dotted line, uh, foreign direct investment hasn't. And it sort of has, has stalled since the great recession, financial recession of 2008 and 2009. Uh, and so you can see across the top of this graph that back in the 1990s, foreign direct investment was growing quite rapidly, over 15%. Uh, trade was growing at 6%, GDP less than that. 
we get into the 2000s, GDP has just growth rates have doubled to a, an average of 7%. Trade has stepped up to 9%. Foreign direct investment has slowed down a little from uh, 15 to 8%. And then we get into uh, the most recent decade. And you can see that GDP grew uh, more, uh, less rapidly, grew slower. So did trade. So those two were in lockstep, no surprise there. But the big surprise is foreign direct investment, which just stalled. So uh, that's the jumping off point for what we see here. Um, again, let me get a drink. The uh, y-axis is the indication of the amount of foreign direct investment. <clears throat> so you can see back in 2015, it was about $2 trillion. Uh, but if you look over at 2021, we're going to get down to about $800 million. Uh, That is a drop of 60%. And by last year, the drop already was 40%. We had dropped down to 1.2 trillion. But now we're going to drop down from 1.2 trillion, uh, I'm sorry, 1.5 trillion. Uh, but uh, uh, the, at the, uh, uh, during the financial crisis uh, in 2009, foreign direct investment dropped down to 1.2 trillion. So we're going to drop down from 1.5 last year to, by 2021, about $800 million. And that is a huge, that's a, that's a drop of a, another 50%. So uh, foreign direct investment is a serious problem. This has great consequences for a number of industries, not least of which is the freight industry, whether it's shipping, or air freight, uh, or the folks who handle freight, uh, or your company, if you want to put a product into another country, you know, the reason for this drop uh, is, first of all, the financial limitations and, and the tendency uh, of countries to nationalize to and regionalize to bring business closer to home. And there's uh, you, you're probably familiar in the news with this consternation between China and the United States and the, the, the United States trying to bring uh, manufacturing that had been done in China back to the United States because uh, suddenly the United States doesn't trust China as much. And lo and behold, when the coronavirus uh, arrived, we found that much of our medicines, in fact, were being produced in China. So that has sort of exacerbated the problem. Uh, long story short, many industries are going to cause this problem and be affected by this problem. We'll try to get into that a little further as we move along here. So <clears throat> this uh, is not uh, the best graph that uh, I have produced, but uh, it, uh, I, uh, you can see I had three holes in it and I just copied it on my scanner. Uh, but uh, what this shows is the decline uh, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, trade uh, depending upon the industry. And you can see that uh, the various lines represent various industries. So the dotted line at the very bottom uh, is the automotive industry. It was supposed to be a representation of the automotive industry uh, and, uh, and a forecast. Uh, and you can see that the uh, bottom is reached uh, right around the end of this year, but it persists uh, into next year and does not get up uh, to the 2019 level, which is 100 on the y-axis. That is 100 represents uh, the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, and so uh, it won't be 
until 20, the end of 2023 or 2024, when the auto industry is, you know, really uh, back in full swing, uh, if this forecast is right. Uh, now, another, the line right above it is the apparel industry. And here we have uh, the, 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 the uh, significance of producers in Asian countries, not just China either. Uh, but um, uh, uh, so uh, once again, this has a big impact on retailers, um, has a big impact on the possibility of producing at home rather than, than uh, producing offshore and or importing. Um, and uh, uh, the line right above it uh, is machinery and equipment. And you can see that we'll get back to uh, about 100, uh, about the, the last level of the last year at the end of 2022. Uh, the lines up above are uh, represent more uh, uh, products with immediate need that are non-discretionary in nature. For instance, food and agricultural product and a lot of chemicals. So uh, the point here to be made is simply that uh, <clears throat> we, the, uh, the industry that we're in or doing business with, if we're supplying it, uh, will have its own unique characteristics uh, uh, based upon the effects of the coronavirus and the relative difficulty of recovering from it. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a graph that came from uh, the uh, UN uh, CTAD, as did the one prior, I believe. Um, but uh, uh, this sort of tracks the sequence by which these impediments to trade uh, occur. And again, please let me get a little sip of tea here. I've got two things going. I've got the tea, and then uh, at, when I'm desperate, I've got coffee with cream in it. The problem is that I'm uh, recording this video late at night. The more coffee I drink, the later, even after now, I'll have to stay up. Anyway, I need a weak, uh, I need a, uh, a moist throat. So we, we start out in 2020 with a lockdown and we're all familiar with the lockdowns. And of course that really put a crimp in uh, the, uh, the economy had brought everything, uh, many industries down. It certainly didn't bring uh, the uh, video conferencing industry down I'm recording this on Zoom, and uh, you're going to be looking at it on Zoom. And Zoom has been one of the most successful technology companies in the, in the world uh, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, and that's because we all need uh, Zoom's services so much to continue doing business or getting an education or giving an education. Anyway, as we pointed out earlier, with the business going down and trade going down, uh, there, there's an effect of volume on profitability. And in this particular case, with lower volume, profit margins go down. And remember that it's the, the profit that uh, fuels 50% of foreign direct investment. So. On top of that, the third uh, arrow down, which is taking us well into 2021 notice, uh, is that there are investment restrictions by various regulators, depending upon the conditions in their country or conditions in other countries where they don't want new people or products to uh, come from so that they can protect themselves from the virus. Moving on along then, uh, what can happen is that as a result of these various, these first three items, it could be that we'll have a, a, a longer lasting recession. I hope this isn't true, but uh, what would happen is 
that the uh, uh, projects uh, to and the new investment projects in particular uh, would be uh, shelved, would be curtailed until the, the, the global economy got uh, stronger again. And then uh, finally, uh, as we, we move along, uh, there will be adjustments in the way uh, business is done in supply chains, global supply chains, uh, and uh, higher degrees of autonomy, as we were talking about, uh, producing more at home, importing less, and so forth. But what we've got way out to 2030, this is a long range uh, estimate, what, what we see happening is uh, that the, uh, the structure of industry changes. Whether it's supply chains, financing, the, uh, the, the, the uh, marketing of uh, product, uh, whether we do business regionally rather than globally or, and so forth. But whole new structural uh, restructurings uh, will occur as a result of these prior uh, changes that have occurred. So you, you are on the cusp of a whole new industrial world, uh, doing business unlike the world that I did business in. Uh, so the kind of trade, the kind of, of, of manufacturing or setting up manufacturing uh, that 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 I was used to when I was doing my thing probably will be completely altered uh, because of what we're going through right now. It's real food for thought because if you're a student watching this video, you're going to be affected by this. The real question is, what will those changes be? And uh, quite honestly. Old guys like me are not in a very good position to tell you because we, we think the way we used to think rather than the way people are going to have to think. Um, <clears throat> here, here's a, 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 a little exhibit from, um, and uh, this, uh, this may have been from the, that Economist article, but I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, it, the article pointed out that uh, it, it, as this thing broke, we were in all sorts of change uh, taking place uh, at, at present. You know, a lot of these changes that will occur in your industrial life uh, were brewing even before the coronavirus arrived. Uh, all kinds of new technology. Uh, protectionist tendencies due to international conflicts. Uh, one of the videos that I produced recently talked about the, uh, the extent of international conflict going on in the world, not just between the US and China, uh, but uh, uh, between China and India and uh, between the US and uh, some uh, some of the Arabian nations. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, when, when you look at it, I think the, the, this one article, this one video that, that I uh, prepared uh, revealed that there were about 20 of these conflicts going on around the world. Uh, some of them were quite large, Russia versus the US, China versus the US. Iraq versus the US. But in the background, allegedly or apparently, apparently are all, all these other conflicts. And some of them are, are not so small. Uh, so the organized groups of terrorists that occupy multiple countries, for instance. So uh, as a result of these things, lots of tendency to bring industry back home. Um, and, uh, and then just to make matters more difficult, we've got this, this uh, press pressure uh, politically and socially uh, to make the environment more habitable, uh, more sustainable. Uh, so <laughs> um, 
the effect you can see on this slide of these things were uh, changing e economics and where things are produced, uh, new hurdles uh, or new, new decisions as to where production has to occur, uh, and uh, uh, how we, uh, we protect the environment. And while all this is going on, and there's a lot of, of conversation about it, bam, comes COVID. Uh, the coronavirus interrupts production and supply chains, introduces a global recession, uh, supply chains get all broken up. Longer term uh, is the question of just how supply chains should be structured in the future because we could have another virus. Uh, that's another issue altogether, but uh, it's be we're becoming aware that there are lots of viruses that can be transmitted uh, from animal to animal and from animal to human. Uh, and that uh, as time passes, more of these things become immune to antiviral compounds. And so we're going to have to plan now to deal logistically with uh, economies that are impaired by uh, epidemics and even another pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the possibility is that there will be a lot more insularity, a lot more uh, nationalism and regionalism as opposed to globalism. This may be the end of globalism as we know it. Uh, so, um, since 2008, FDI has lagged the growth of GDP and trade. Um, and the causes we've talked about are uh, nationalism, protectionism, regionalism. Um, the, uh, the, the article that, uh, from the UN talked about possibilities uh, of, uh, of robotics uh taking on the work of people so that if people get sick the production line can still uh go on uh it also is true that uh we can digitalize uh the way we uh we identify uh where we want to have a product produced we can uh, put digital instructions into robots and machining centers and put the, that machinery wherever in our region we feel we're comfortable uh, and uh, it's close enough that we can get to it and get shipments from it rather than perhaps from the other side of the world. And a good example is 3D manufacturing. I don't know whether you're familiar with it or not, but uh, we can now make uh, with d deposition, uh, uh, 3D manufacturing. <laughs> uh, uh, if, you, if you don't know about it, Google it. If you do know about it, you know what I, uh, what I mean. But uh, we can program a machine that will layer by layer produce a product. Uh, what is amazing to me, and this has existed for quite a while, is that we can make a product out of uh, metal, uh, powdered metal, and then bake it, and it becomes hard metal. But we can make a product uh, this way with cavities in it and so forth, uh, so that it, it might be a valve, or it could be uh, a pretty sophisticated uh, uh, machinery component. If we had to make it the old way, we would do tooling and we would make, make the pieces of that little sub-assembly and then weld them together. Uh, and the, the result is that those welds could break. When we make parts by 3D manufacturing, they're actually stronger than the old way. And yet we can put machining centers and 3D uh, uh, deposition machines in manufacturing cells around our region, if not around the world, uh, and uh, uh, 
they'll work pretty much in another location the same way they work in our location. Probably still have to have some trained operators there, but in any event, uh, these, these technology trends are enabling us to deal with the impediments imposed on us by phenomena such as epidemics and pandemics. Uh, so <clears throat> this article uh, talked about the possibilities of uh, reshoring, that is bringing things back from China or wherever, uh, regionalization by taking advantage of digitalization so that we can put these, low, these, these machining centers and whatever other apparatus in, in um, duplicate uh, uh, operations. The operation looks the same no matter where it happens to be geographically and, uh, and control it uh, and instruct it digitally. Uh, we can, and uh, another response to this situation, and of course all of these are strategic in nature, uh, is to diversify your supply sources. Again, what did we run into with medicines from China? They were almost, in many cases, made in just that one location. Uh, and it, it, they're, they, they're still being made there. And to my knowledge, most of them are getting into this country. But there is a desire not to be dependent upon China uh, because another pandemic could occur or a political uh, rift could occur. Uh, so maybe, maybe we'd like to diversify our supply sources and maybe what we'd like to do is have them in our region, if not back in our country. Uh, because in some parts of our region, uh, labor costs may be lower, material costs may be lower. It may just see, be more advantageous to produce it other than in our country, but not so far away that we can't get control of it when we need to. Uh, and finally, uh, replication. And to be very honest with you, this, 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 this article, uh, this source just did not really uh, give a good example uh, or a good explanation. But uh, I, I have some experience in the automotive industry. And in that industry, uh, there is a, a move uh, to try to produce a a uh, common platform uh, on which a variety of models can be built. Uh, and uh, uh, the same is true uh, for manufacturing methods. You may be able to use the same kind of machinery and equipment and methodology, such as machining centers, 3D manufacturing, and robotics. Uh, and, uh, and so you can replicate or duplicate your manufacturing process and your product uh, in, in uh, uh, multiple locations uh, or, and or your same country, if you will. But basically, simply uh, make it easy to have more than one location so that if people get sick one place, you can still operate in another one. Uh, so uh, th this is an ex a diagram that uh, came with the same article. Uh, and uh, so you see reshoring, diversification, regionalization, and replication. Uh, and uh, uh, rather than dwelling on all those words in the blue center, uh, I'm just going to pick off a couple words from the right-hand column uh, to be sure we're clear on what it means. If we're reshoring, we're, we're making our value chain. I hope you know what a value chain is. Uh, but that, that process from the design all the way down to uh, getting materials, assembling products, distributing them, and putting them to the customer, uh, either by sh shipping them to another uh, industrial location or putting them in the hands of retailers to sell to you and me. Uh, but uh, the uh, reshoring means that our value chains will probably be uh, uh, shorter, uh, which may make it easier to move fast, 
and, uh, and less costly. The supply chain elements may be rebundled as a result of that. Less outshoring, less offshoring. Diversification is somewhat uh, the different. Remember that diversification can simply mean, see, we have the word digitalization there in the middle, uh, that uh, uh, we can use platforms and diversify uh, our uh, either put multiple products in multiple locations or at least locate uh, perhaps with platforms uh, multiple locations that uh, are in uh, different locations uh, so that we're sure to be able to meet our production requirements. Regionalization simply recognizes that uh, it's easier to operate shorter distances than longer distances. You, you're, still, uh, you're still able to do outsourcing and offshoring, but you're doing it from a, uh, with, with a greater uh, control due to a shorter uh, span, a shorter geographic span. And finally, replication. Uh, which is uh, what I tried to explain uh, so haltingly uh, before. Uh, we were able to concentrate the, the, uh, uh, the processes uh, because we can put them into uh, platforms or collections of uh, machinery and equipment that all function pretty much the same way and duplicate those processes so they're identical. They're, they're satellites that all look like each other. Um, at least that's my uh, way of potentially interpreting this notion of replication. Uh, so um, we had an article on global freight flows uh, that are impacted by the coronavirus and all these things we've been talking about. Um, and uh, in the uh, second and third quarters of this year, uh, as we're recovering, the US economy will be recovering, uh, but uh, global trade uh, around the world will drop between 13 and 22%, again, depending on industry and location. And that's while the GDP will drop between three and 8%. So, even though GDPs are slowing down, international trade is slowing down more. And uh, so what is it that enables the GDP to not, uh, not decline as fast as trade? And of course, the answer is that if trade had picked up, uh, if trade hadn't dropped that low, global GDP wouldn't have even dropped three to eight. It would have been, it would have been even better. Uh, but another way to look at uh, the, those numbers is to say uh, global GDP didn't drop like international trade because we had reshoring and regionalization. Some of that's already going on and uh, more in the future. Uh, so um, recovery uh, to trade levels in the fourth quarter of 2019 last year is going to take between 15 and 48 months uh, in this, uh, according to this article. Um, and the amount of uh, trade that is lost uh, will be anywhere between eight and 50% of uh, trade, all trade volume in 2019. Air cargo um, won't recover until uh, 2022. Uh, partly that's because air cargo uh, may or may not be permitted in another destination uh, or permitted to leave a point of origin. Uh, but sometimes air cargo is on the lower portion of a uh, commercial uh, air, air, uh, airlines aircraft. And, uh, you know, it, 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 you've probably heard that the uh, commercial aviation industry has really been impacted by the coronavirus, terrible. Ocean transport, about the same uh, amount. 
container cargo as opposed to uh, bulk shipping uh, uh, even more. Uh, and that's because there's more air in, con in container uh, containers. They uh, it, you, you can't compact as much into them. Um, if you look at this from the perspective of trade routes, uh, trade from Asia to the north to North America, the expectation during this time will be a drop of 20 percent. Whereas from North America, which is the U.S. and Canada and Mexico. Only eight percent. So uh, we're going to buy less from the Asians. Uh, they're not going to cut their purchases from us as much. But eight percent is a pretty big cut, and we're going to feel that economically. Uh, from Asia to Europe, twenty percent, just like Asia to America. Europe to Asia, uh, worse than North America to Asia. In that case, it's 13%. And then you can see the other routes, Europe to North America, North America to Europe, about 13%. South America to North America, North America to South America, about 12%. Uh, so uh, there's going to be quite an impact on trade. Um, at the article that we looked at, this was a McKinsey article. Uh, and uh, the, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I think I've actually got that one somewhere on my desk here because I was looking at it just recently. That's not it, though. Um, okay, so the, uh, uh, in any event, uh, the author uh, of this McKinsey article, or the authors, there were several authors, uh, suggests that what we need to do is look at the various scenarios based on country, based on what could happen uh, politically, uh, what could, how effective the virus and the, uh, the therapeutic drugs are, and under different sets of assumed circumstances, a recovery is going to happen faster or slower, and based on that, uh, we can make decisions as to how given those circumstances, we would want to alter our strategy to aim uh, our selling, marketing, and distribution, uh, and supply chains uh, in the direction of one region, uh, one part of the world, or another. Um, here's the, uh, for those of you who are, who are concerned, I think we're, we're getting uh, pretty close to the end here, but uh, there's a, a major uh, issue, uh, and that is public transit. And again, I think this was a McKinsey or article, and I'm almost sure it was. Uh, but uh, public transit is vital for those of you who have spent time in uh, Europe, as I have. Uh, please think of uh, England, uh, but better still, uh, the Czech Republic or Hungary. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, many uh, European countries, as well as uh, co countries in other parts of the world, depend upon public transit. Uh, folks don't get around uh, by car the way that uh, you and I probably are used to, and some of you may assume that that's the way it is in other uh, uh, other countries. Um, and and uh, uh, that's not the case. Now, where the car is as popular as uh, it is in uh, the United States uh, might be Japan. And with the coronavirus <laughs> cutting out all the public transit that is there, uh, you gotta you got to be in Tokyo to understand what what traffic jams really are. Uh, the, the, these are swarms of cars that, that just can't move. Uh, and, uh, and now take that same image and put it in, Bang in Delhi uh, or Bangalore, India, or one of the other big cities in India where everybody gets around uh, by public transit, whether it's rail 
or, or a bus. People are just jammed in uh, next to each other. Um, in Moscow, another city I've been in, uh, you know, the, it's, they, they use the underground rail the, uh, like they do in, in uh, London. Uh, but uh, uh, you know that during the busy season, people get right up next to each other in a subway car. Uh, well, and they do that for that matter in New York, uh, where I used to live. And I can remember when I was a young man having to ride in subway cars. I'm glad I don't do that anymore. Uh, but it's just imagine that kind of a setting and people have still got the coronavirus. Well, they can't do that, can they? Because if they did, the virus would continue to spread. So uh, how do you deal with this problem? And it is a huge problem. And if you then extend this problem from buses and subways to airplanes uh, and uh, crowded uh, thoroughfares where in, in India, for instance, Many of the vehicles that people ride in uh, are not the kind of vehicle that you're used to. Uh, the, it's more like a golf cart. Um, it's got a gas engine, but it, it, it's open and people are all jammed together. So if there's a coronavirus going on in India and people are in traffic jams in these open vehicles, you've got the same problem as if they're in a subway car. Uh, so uh, it, it's a, this is a, the, the, the problem of public transit is a huge one. Um, so and the, the, about 100 cities have populations of at least 4 million. Believe it or not, I'm going to show those to you. It's not going to take me more than a minute. Uh, so, so rest easy. But 100 cities. It's, it's actually 99, but um, uh, I put a the top 100 in this, this exhibit, um, have a pop uh, population of at least 4 million. Uh, and so these are pretty crowded locations. And most of them have difficulty uh, controlling uh, a situation like the pandemic. Uh, and most of them rely on public transit. Uh, and if people get into a bus or a subway the way they're used to, uh, you know, it's going to be really difficult to control the coronavirus. Uh, so uh, what's happened is that the, we've had these lockdowns where business just closes down. And the result is that there's been less uh, traffic. Uh, however, the, uh, the coronavirus uh, has, and my, my bullet B there isn't just, isn't quite right, worded quite right, but depending on the circumstances, uh, the safe transit capacity has been reduced to 15 to 35%. So in the London subway, the tubes, uh, it's safe to have 13 to 15% of normal traffic volume in the London subway. And your question should be, what do the 80, other 85 to 87% of the people do? Do they go to work? Do they go to school? What do they do? Uh, in Holland, they've got a, and, and throughout Europe, they have wonderful uh, rail system. I, I've, uh, I've spent a lot of time in Holland too. Uh, but their, their railway system can handle about 20 to 25 percent of uh, the normal volume uh, when, when you adjust for the coronavirus. So uh, as the economies of the United States and Europe get better, uh, ridership is going to have to uh, come back up again. Right now, it's come down so that there's, there's less of a conflict between safe capacity and transit demand. But as the economy comes back up, what are we going to do? And in fact, that problem already is with us. So 
Here is a uh, summary of the proportions of riders uh, based upon why they are riding the bus or the subway or the trolley car or the commuter train. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, employment accounts for about half of it. Notice that some of that employment is a little more important than others, uh, such as health care. Um, education, about 20% of the riders are, uh, are students. Um, just visiting, just, just getting around, 17%. Maybe we can, we can do without that. Uh, recreation, well, we need recreation, but you know, maybe we could do without that. Uh, so uh, what are our options here? First of all, we could just say, you've got to have a pass uh, because you're a student or you're a healthcare worker. In that case, you can get on the subway or the bus if it hasn't reached its safe capacity already. Uh, you can stagger the stops so that uh, the bus doesn't get to its safe capacity after it's reached its first two stops. You can uh, stagger ridership. You can allow some people to ride during some parts of the day, but not others. And you would ask industrial employers to stagger their work hours accordingly. Of course, the best way of all is to work from home. Uh, and then you can impose rules. Uh, everybody's got to have a face mask on the bus, for instance. And if everybody did that, the article informs us that uh, the, uh, the writer, sh the uh, safe capacity would be increased. So uh, there, not everything is, uh, is, is doom and gloom. Most is. Uh, but in this diagram here, uh, we see uh, and I'm sorry for the quality of the, oh, I, this was not a large exhibit. Uh, and uh, uh, so I scanned uh, the uh, exhibit, the article, uh, and, uh, and then expanded it in, uh, in the PowerPoint slide, which made it more difficult to read. So I, I'm, uh, I'm going to point some things out. First of all, there's a line way up here. That's New York City uh, and it's air pollution uh, level and particularly uh, nitrogen dioxide, uh, which uh, uh, is the product of, uh, of uh, automotive uh, exhaust. Uh, and uh, uh, here, this month down here uh, is, uh, is April. I'm sorry, over here, right at the bottom is April. And so you can see that as time passes, I could have also brought New, this is New York City, by the way. These words are New York City. So I put that in there. But New York City got as high as just about anybody. Uh, then worked its way back down and kept coming down. Uh, this label here is Paris. This one down here is Bangalore, which is a manufacturing location um, in India. Um, and uh, so here's Bangalore up here uh, before the coronavirus. And then the lockdowns occur and the pollution levels come down drastically, don't they? By the way, this label is London, England here. Uh, so London uh, did not respond quite as much as other, uh, others did. And their, their, their pollution level came down, uh, their uh, nitrogen uh, dioxide came down, but not as much as uh, other cities where uh, the, the, the traffic was, was halted. But you can see now that economies are recovering, uh, the air pollution levels are picking back up. And by the way, this scale is air pollution. Um, this, this is Paris, and you can see 
that the uh, after the, uh, the the pollution level went up, there were corrective actions taken to push it back down again, um, and uh, and so on. So uh, when you have a lockdown, your air quality gets better. Uh, I don't know what's going to come of that, but some politician's going to figure out that lockdowns are a good idea. You can just see it coming. Uh, anyway, uh, this a little diagram here uh, reflects uh, road traffic congestion. And this one is nitrogen, nitrogen di dioxide, uh, which is uh, another uh, very strong air uh, pollutant from uh, automobile exhaust. And uh, there, there are all these little spots here are uh, observations of different cities. Uh, but up here uh, is Delhi, India, uh, during the week when the lockdown began. And here it is uh, one month later. And it's if you work your way over to the side uh, this is a pretty substantial reduction uh, in air pollution. And as a result of these two phenomena, uh, which is all one, uh, these were the death rates uh, that were reduced and the number of people that didn't die as a result of cleaner air. And the one at the very top is Delhi. Uh, and in this particular case, um, the uh, it was it looks like about 4,644 people did not die. Uh, and by the way, there's a number inside each of these circles. The size of the circle indicates uh, the number of deaths per 1,000 100,000 people uh, due to air pollution. And you can see that Tel Delhi has a pretty big circle. The biggest one of all is this purple one. And lo and behold, that's our friend Paris. Uh, that, that gives me great, food, great reason for thought because I kind of like Paris and I, I, I speak French and, and uh, 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 Paris, ça c'est une belle cité. That's a very, very attractive city. So to think that uh, now that I know it's polluted, I'm going to have to watch myself. OK, so uh, we're about done here. Um, here are the first 30 of the top 100 cities in terms of population. Ah, pardon me. Uh, Tokyo is, is the biggest, and they can handle it. Uh, the, the problem is traffic congestion. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, Tokyo is probably uh, one of the better off cities to deal with this. By the way, uh, this column here is the growth rate of population, and you can see that uh, uh, Tokyo is not growing very fast, and in time, uh, Japan's population is, is declining. But here's Mumbai, or used to be called Bombay, uh, Delhi, uh, both of which are in India, and Dhaka, which is uh, Dhaka, I guess, and Bangladesh, which uh, India and Bangladesh used to be part of the same country at one time. Uh, but their, their, their borders are, are connected. Uh, and you can see their growth rates are really fast. As a matter of, and now if we add just uh, Mumbai and Delhi, we get uh, about 52 million people. If we throw Dhaka uh, on top of it, we're, we're up to about 74, 75, 74 million people. Um, that's a lot of people. And they're all, they're, in each of these cities, they're crowded together and they don't have a lot of technology. What's the chance that they're going to be able to get uh, the coronavirus under control uh, as easily as in this country or, or as quickly? 
and I hope you're smart enough to say the chances are pretty slim. Uh, now, uh, what, what about shipping things to India? Uh, we could send our plane to India with the cargo, but if that plane came back, would it have coronavirus in it? Um, and uh, do we want our people uh, to work there? Uh, just what's going to become of trade between India and the United States? By the way, if we look further down in these lists, we'll see more uh, uh, countries in India. Here you can see Bangalore with just about 10 uh, million people. By the way, New York City is pegged at 20. Uh, you can Google uh, New York City plus sign population uh, population in 2020, uh, according to the city, is 18 million. Uh, and uh, it really depends on how you count New York's population because it's got seven boroughs and it's got uh, uh, suburbs. I used to live uh, in Harrison, uh, New York, which was, a, uh, and, and I lived in Rye, another uh, town up in the suburbs of Westchester County. Um, that is often included in the New York metro area. So I'm not sure exactly what this 20 million means, but uh, it's, 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 it's too big. Um, and, uh, uh, but nevertheless, if you've got 18 or 20 million people all jammed up against each other, it's, it's very possible for the coronavirus or something like it to spread very quickly when you're cramming these numbers of people. These are all millions of people, right? And from, from Jakarta uh, up, it's 20 million or more. Uh, and then we get down uh, to the 10 millions. Shanghai. Uh, wonderful city, uh, uh, 12 and a half million. And, and uh, uh, th th there's no indicated growth there, but uh, I think there probably is. Uh, Beijing, about the same size. Uh, Wuhan, where the coronavirus began and where all that manufacturing occurs, about 9 million. And so it only takes a, a city with a population of 9 million uh, to really uh, move this stuff along. Here are some other big cities. You can see their populations keep coming down. Here's uh, a city in Bangladesh, which is growing at 4.3% uh, per year. Uh, here's uh, Surat in India, growing at 5% per year. Uh, Kabul at 4.7% per year. Uh, a, a city in China, which is just incredible. I don't know this city, but 10.5% per year. Good God almighty. Uh, you know, that means that uh, every year they're, they've got a, a half a million more people. Um, so uh, we, uh, we just need to be aware that in every one of these cities, you've got crowding, You've got all the right ingredients for uh, a virus to multiply. So, um, and here are some others that uh, you, uh, uh, you might or might not be interested in, but you can see that um, the, uh, the 3.97, I'm going to call that 4 million because by now, Guangzhou is already up to 4 million. Uh, and uh, then Cape Town and Lucknow uh, uh, around uh, almost 4 million. So um, <clears throat> with so many big cities in the world, recovering from COVID is going to take quite a while. So strategically, if your corporation is, is a multinational enterprise, you cannot assume that just as soon as we're going to have a vaccine, this problem is going to go away. It's not. And if the industry that you're in is heavily dependent upon transportation, be it by air or ocean, uh, you've got serious trouble, both going and coming back. 
um, if, uh, uh, if, if you've been manufacturing a product uh, in one of these cities, uh, because labor costs are cheap, you may not even be able to get the product <laughs> anymore. Uh, but you're probably going to want to move your manufacturing, even though it's costly to do that, to some place that's safer and closer and so forth, all the things that we've been talking about. So uh, because of the multitude of large cities and the congestion of cities, it's going to be very difficult to get this thing back under control. And that's the very first thing we talked about. It's going to be very difficult uh, to get the, to return to normal right away. And so your strategic planning needs to start doing contingency planning. What happens if it takes four years? What happens if we get quicker recovery in the cities we're interested in? What happens if there's regulatory limitations and so forth? You've got to come up with a lot of what ifs and form strategic plans to respond to those what ifs. So uh, with that, uh, I will end this rather long video, but I hope it's been uh, interesting to you. And I hope it's put a new light on the coronavirus problem uh, for you. Uh, I can tell you that it wasn't long ago that I was thinking, and I still think, oh boy, I can't wait till I can get that virus as a vaccine. As soon as they've got that vaccine, I'm going to be the first one in line. I want that vaccine, even if it's only 50% effective. I'm hoping that when the coin flips, mine, it's heads for me and that I, it works for me. Uh, and very likely, you know, with the good technology we have, maybe it'll be better than 50%. Maybe it'll be 90. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, you know, even though we have uh, these, uh, these devices that are going to help us address the coronavirus, it's going to be a long time before industry as we know it gets back to normal. And one of the things we concluded earlier is it may never get back to normal. It may be that industry value chains, industry technology, work habits, the way people go to work or don't, thanks to Zoom, uh, that all that's going to change. And the way we do business as industry in the future, because of what we're going through now, will be nothing like it's been in the past. And with that happy thought, uh, I will press the button which should enable me to end this video. Goodbye. Oops.